if you want to talk about anything else, I'm happy to do it either now. Well, one or... of the th one of the things I wanted to mention <clears throat> uh, in uh, have you read the Young White Letters? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a place. Let's see. I've got his letter here. <clears throat> This is um, the letter to Father White on October 5th, 1945, mm -hmm. page 5. And uh, if you go to, let's see, I hope I've got the right one here. I'm not seeing what I'm looking for. Anyway, you will re you will know this quote, I think. Right. Um, he says, Father White, I am not saying that the God image is everything. So uh, for me, that helps me as a Christian who has been having these mystical experiences and a love relationship with God through Christ mm -hmm. for many, many years. Uh, to me, my belief is and my feeling of it is that God very much cares about me Surely. personally and is in the process of moving me, we would say, through individuation. Surely. That these Surely. things that come into my life are kind of breaking an old pattern and I've got to scramble like mad with God's help to get over that hump. Right. Uh, now the, the problem I'm having now, I don't know whether I will get over the hump again because of health issues uh, and um, mental issues and so forth. And I've been in this crisis now for about a year. Well, maybe it started in 2012 when my partner was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. um, and when he died, I just went into quite a descent sure. into grief and uh, have not been able to kind of get through that so i've experienced a number of times where i just don't want to get out of bed and this has gone on now for almost two years uh, and i'm at a very low point now with needing help from family i've seen counselors you know but i know i know this is god's doing in a sense and god is with me and God but is I with you in your lamentation about the loss of your partner. But because of my health issues, I don't know if this will be moving towards the end of my life. And I had a mystical experience recently where um, I was I was standing at the end of my life, leaving everything behind, everything I had ever known, and I had not yet entered into whatever is next. Uh, and it was terrifying. So I'm trying to digest that. I'm trying, I finally have been able to go back to that image of myself in that place and be present to that image mm -hmm. and see that image evolve. So a little active imagination there. And I'm continuing to do that. But I do have a certain doubt. Am I going to... Uh, be reborn or am I going to come to the end of my life with through this particular trial well let, let me put it this way your spirit if we publish this video then your spirit is going to continue on no matter what happens to your physical life okay because you're expressing this doubt and I let me tell you uh, what I told my father. Okay, my father um, got, when he was uh, 75 years old, he got scratched by a cat 
and it was a feral cat on his farm and he just got scratched across his uh, belly and it got infected and his it got so infected that his belly grew up blew up double okay was wow. terribly infected and he tried to avoid going to the hospital because he hated hospitals but finally he went and um, he was in the hospital for two weeks and at one point I went to visit him and uh, they had gotten the infection under control but he had reduced to 112 pounds which for him was he was just a bag of bones okay literally and one time I picked him up and helped him move and it was like picking up a skeleton literally and so I was I'd gotten him comfortable again and I looked down at him and he had this very sad look on his face and this big grimace and I said um, well dad what's bothering you and he said well I'm worried about kicking the bucket and I said well don't worry about that a hundred billion people have tried it and we have no complaints no. just just worry about what you're going to do between now and then and um, and suddenly his demeanor just changed when I said that you know just think about what you're going to do between now and then and his demeanor changed his whole attitude about life changed I watched it physically change at that moment and he lived another eight years one of the things that has happened as I've been working with this is over the Easter period it came very clear to me uh, Jesus Jesus has been through the death process he will be with you uh, so you're not going to be alone and he knew he knows how to do this <laughs> he will help you learn how to do this and then later on and a few days later or so forth came in I've got the collective unconscious that contains the wisdom of all the dying people sure and and I'm connected to that wisdom so right. there there is that sense of uh, I'm not alone which was the terrifying I think part losing everything and and the ter and uh, the terrifying part you're certainly not alone and as you probably know Dr. Young did talk about the fact that uh, we know how to die we don't know it but I mean consciously but as we as creatures reach the end of our lives we know how to die and I don't sense that's your case and and the fact that by synchronicity you have come to me and also by synchronicity I'm just listening to this Jordan Peterson video that he just or I'm sorry not Jordan Peterson Paul Vanderclay video that he just published today where he's talking about Carl Jung and Jordan Peterson um, where uh, do you know who Paul Vanderclay is or no. Jordan, uh, or Jordan Peterson either one no. of them okay well um, Jordan Peterson is a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto and he wrote a book called the 12 rules of life and before that a book called maps of meaning and um, he got into a political issue that is kind of irrelevant but um, it made him quite famous and so then he started to give lectures on the Bible which you can find on the internet you just put in Jordan Peterson Bible lectures and they'll all come up I'll put it in the chat here for you um, and he did uh, I think uh, 13 of them so there's about 26 hours of Jordan Peterson starting at Genesis in the Bible and talking about the Bible from a psychological perspective and it's very interesting what he, what he said and what Paul Vanderclay who is a um, I'll give you his name because you can look his YouTube 
channel up, uh, Paul Vanderclay got interested in these biblical uh, lectures and uh, he started to make videos about them, commenting on, on the biblical lectures and lo and behold he started to see that people were getting more interested in coming to church and and but still he hasn't understood why okay and unfortunately uh, Jordan Peterson's perception of what's happening is let's call it shallow I've, I've had a, a one Jungian analyst that I know who wrote to me and said thank you for commenting on Peterson's work because it's shallow and one-sided his work is mainly about the patriarchy you know perhaps by synchronicity you you and I have now met and you're uh, you're a educated person in both Jung and uh, Christian spirituality so what I'm trying to do is build the bridge that Dr. Jung lamented that he never could get done. Okay, and uh, where is it here? Okay, so in this book, in Ion, okay, if you look at uh, paragraph 63, which is a very interesting paragraph, um, Dr. Jung is talking about uh, three things, the, the shadow, the syzygy, which is the anima animus, and the self. And he said, these are psychic factors of which an adequate picture can be formed only on the basis of a th fairly thorough experience of them. Uh, just as these concepts arose out of an experience of reality, so they can be elucidated only by further experience. Philosophical criticism will find everything to object in them unless it begins by recognizing that they are concerned with facts, his psychic facts, and that the concept is simply an abbreviated description or definition of these facts. Such criticism has as little effect on the object as zoological criticism has on a duck-billed platypus. And, and so his point is that, um, you know, in the scientific method, you hold every one, th one thing constant and wipe out all the variables. And in depth psychology, you can't do that. A psychic fact is like a cheese ball. It contains a lot of elements to it, and so you can't you can't uh, solve for X, okay, yeah. which is which is what people people of the rational mind of the logos insist on. They want to solve for X, but in the psyche, there's no solution for X. There is only the experience of X, and so in this case, you know the zoologists can write as many books as they want. Uh, about the duck-billed platypus, but the duck-billed platypus over in Australia is going to keep paddling on regardless of what they say, True. right? True. And, yeah. and so the opposite of the logos is not eros, it's life, life itself. Right. And, and, um... Oh, and I so wanted to share, I found that quote, uh, in the Young White Letters on page seven, at the top of the page, Young writes, when I said that God is a complex, I meant to say whatever he is, he is at least a very tangible complex. You can say he is an illusion, but he is at least a psychological fact. I surely never intended to say he is nothing else but a complex. Right. And I think that little place there he is nothing else but a complex has opens a connection between christianity and jungian psychology precisely there is there is this place i don't know if it can even be defined it 
when Christians and Jungians tend to talk, they get to a certain point and it's like magnets turned on end where they just cannot get, they just, they're both repelling each other. Right, they're not right. getting anywhere. And that, but, the fundamental uh, issue is the issue of Gnosticism. And I heard Paul Vanderclay an hour ago talking, giving some sort of definition of Gnosticism, and he completely missed the point, which is the Gnostics were about experience. And the psyche can only be experienced. It can't be defined per se. It, and so, um, you know, the Bible represents a certain sum of experience, but most of those experiences came out of dreams and visions. <laughs> and so, so they well, came they out Well, they were of, experiences. I mean, generally yes. what's written, that they're writing down their experience of God and uh, that was their experience. Right. And so, you know, Dr. Jung was asked, so do you believe in God? And he said, well, I, I can't really believe in something unless I know it. And I ha only know it by experience. And so he says, I really have no need to believe because I know. Right. And, of course, that statement is the one thing that everybody knows <laughs> about Jung, that he's, he made this, this uh, myster mysterious statement about the fact that he knows, but it's about having a religious experience. And, right. you know, William James was writing about this at the end of the 19th century when he wrote his book called uh, Varieties of Religious Experience. And so what you know, if somebody asks me whether I believe in God, I have to say I have no need to believe because I know. And when you're talking about you having, um, you know, uh, mystical experiences, you know, too. And, and so once you know that, then you can't go back. You never go back. And you know, in fact, I I go to a, a Buddhist meditation group every week, once a week, with believe it or not, five women psychologists, and and uh, we have a Tibetan Buddhist Lama who uh, teaches us, and um, he's a monk, and he's teaching. Well, in Buddhism, we have the eight of this and the sixty of that, and so on and so that's all logos again and the point is and he he said this explicitly this noontime that that um, once you have the experience of enlightenment you're never going to go back you don't need these 60 things or fit five things or all these all these different enumerations of things and um, let me uh, give I'm going to give you um, a couple of things here. Let me give you Encounters with the Greater Personality, first of all, uh, which is a lecture by Edward Edinger in which he talks about this very point. I'm going to put it on the chat. Are you seeing the chat? Well, I see a little... I've never used Zoom before, so this is new to me. I've got a little orange box that says chat and the number three in it. Okay, so click, on, click, click, on, click, click on that and that's going to bring up, uh, that's going to bring up um, your, uh, your chat I see box. It, uh, yeah, I see Encounters with a Greater Personality and the okay. Jordan Peterson Bible Lectures and Paul Vanderlei. Right, and here's Edinger's summary of Jungian psych psychology, um, where this is an interview with Edinger where he's asked, what is the relevance of Jung's work to religion? And unfortunately, the, that interview disappeared, but this second link is uh, a part of that interview and so he's asked what what is Jung's relevance to religion and he thinks for a minute and then he says everything everything and 
And he's quite right, because he goes on to say in that lecture, which I've transcribed here so that you can read it, um, he says, uh, you know, Jung penetrated to the source of all religions, not only, um, not only Christianity, but all religions. And so then, there, so there are the three Edinger uh, items. Two of them are lectures, which he are available online, and the third one is that interview with him, where he's asked this question. And th those are all transcripts. I personally transcribed all of those, so that you could read them. Uh, you said you're going to join our advanced reading group, are you? I'm going to try it a couple of times and see if a feeling type can handle that group. Well, I think, I hope so, okay, and um, we, we certainly need it, okay, we certainly need it, uh, but these are all very knowledgeable people about Jungian psychology, basically, uh, at different levels, but they're, they're two gentlemen who are extremely knowledgeable, way more than me, and uh, I have to admit that probably we're all thinking types, including Sophie, who is is a uh, French woman, but she's a she's a software engineer, so she's <laughs> she's probably more of a thinking type than a feeling type, yeah. I suppose. But and I, the feeling, my feeling uh, function, gets very nervous about being in a group with T's. When I was in high school and taking physics was a small high school and there were uh, six boys, myself and the male teacher and they all gave me a valentine and it said from uh, to Snow White from the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> well, they but, were right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, I know that if, if feeling is an inferior function, it's uncomfortable to have someone feeling, expressing themselves, and I'm a little fear, afraid of rejection. Well, well let, uh, first of all, you're not going to be rejected, and let me point out to you something that you should already know, which is that Dr. Jung, all of his work, his entire oeuvre comes from the feeling side. Okay, it doesn't come from the thinking side. and. He, he said in the Red Book uh, that he actually had to kill his thinking side. And uh, you probably have read the dream about killing Siegfried. And, no, I haven't read that. Okay, well, there's a, it's in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. It's also... Oh, well, then I've read it and forgotten. Right, and it's also in the Red Book, but basically what he realized was that this dream was about killing off his rational side so that he could uh, do what he needed to do in his career. And he had loved all of his science and all of his rationalism all the way along, but he, from that time he knew that he had to work on the irrational side, the the feeling side. And so all of his work is on the feeling side. So uh, you can probably help us. I mean, you're probably more knowledgeable than most of us since you've been studying it a long while as well. So I'm sure you can make a great contribution. But the, the, what I want to emphasize to you is that uh, the subject matter is on the feeling side. And so um, it's not a question, you know, I could see your concern if you were going to be in a group of six theologians who were talking about the word, because that's, <laughs> that's all logic, okay? And, and they'll hammer you with, with uh, Aquinas said this, and Origen said that, and yada, 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 all day long. And you know, that's all well and good, but that doesn't have to do with what Dr. Young's work is about, really. 
And that's the part that people haven't understood about his work. It's a problem that he had never, I mean, he lamented, even in this paragraph, I didn't read it all to you. Uh, let me read the rest of this paragraph after the duckbill platypus, and this is paragraph 63 of Ion. He says, it is not the concept that matters, okay, not the rational side. The concept is only a word, a counter. It has meaning and use only because it stands for a certain sum of experience. Unfortunately, I cannot pass on this experience to my public. I have tried in a number of publications with the help of case material to present the nature of these experiences and also the method of obtaining them. Whenever my methods were really applied, the facts I give have been confirmed. One could see the moons of Jupiter even in Galileo's day if one took the trouble to use his telescope. And I'll, I'll just put this citation because you probably have Ion there. It's paragraph 63 of Ion, which is uh, volume 9-2. Okay, so there it is on the chat. Thank you. And, um, and so, you know, I, I kept reading Jung's work and it was very useful to me in managing my own psychic balance, but there came a time when I grokked it, when I got it, right? Um, do you understand? Was there anything that particularly helped you after uh, a defeat or after the ego defeat, after breaking your leg or uh, losing your business? Or was there anything you read of his that was particularly helpful? Memories, Dreams, and Reflections is helpful since it's written more for the layman in mind. But, you know, ultimately I got to the point where I knew that I had to go back and uh, look at his collected works. And I avoided that for many years. I, I worked from secondary sources for many years. So in answer to your question, yes, there is one thing that helped me a lot, and that was the Red Book. Have you read the Red Book? No. Okay. Well, let me uh, explain why. In 1993, uh, I experienced an anima possession, <clears throat> which was the result of thinking that I wanted to write a novel. First of all, I had read that Michael Creighton said the way to write a novel was to ask a question. And all my life I had a question because when I was 15, my family went to Japan and uh, we lived in a Japanese house in Kamakura, which is the location of the great Buddha of Kamakura, among other things. And um, we had a live in housemate who was uh, eight years older than me. She was 23 and she was a live-in maid so she was there and so on one fine Saturday I asked my father you know how did Michiko-san come to be with us and his answer was well uh, Japanese farm girls come to Tokyo to quote-unquote earn their dowry Okay, so that was the end of that incident. Uh, I, afterward, I have completed high school in Japan, three years worth, and then I came back to the States for 16 years, and then I went back to Japan in business for five years. I ran a company in Japan. So I had a, a lot of experience with Japanese life and the way people are in Japan. And... So, I, I, there was this incident which I actually described a couple of days ago, and you can see on the on the YouTube channel uh, because it has a magenta cover. <laughs> uh, I wrote this novel, and but I I asked the question, you know, what would happen if a girl like that became the first woman prime minister of Japan? What would her life be like? 
and beginning at age 15 and ending at age 75, or the, the novel a ends at age 75. She doesn't die at that point, but, but the novel ends there. So it covers a 60 year period. And so the novel is called Mako Memoirs of a Woman. And so how does a man get off writing the memoirs of a woman, right? Well, I had read uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes's book, uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves. And in that book, there is a, a discussion of how women's intu in, intuition is developed. And it comes after uh, a short story called uh, Vasilisa the Wise. And of course, Clarissa Pinkola Estes is a very famous a union analyst and so after that short story there's these 34 pages she wrote about the nine steps that women go through uh, to develop their intuition which is part of women's individuation of course and so I decided to use that roadmap as sort of the roadmap of my novel, although you wouldn't know it by reading my novel because I put it in a Japanese patina and, and there's a lot of stuff that probably uh, Dr. Estes wouldn't <laughs> approve it of because there were shadow materials there. But anyway, at the end of the eight months, and it literally contains erotica, so I was still in the middle of my business career and I said to myself, my God, what am I going to do with this? And I actually wrote it in a pen name, but I put it in my drawer for 21 years. And so 16 years later, in 2009, the Red Book was published. And what happened to me was I started to have this intense visioning period during the writing of the novel. And so I would, I would literally be awakened by a vision of Mako at age 15 wearing a kimono. She would wake me up in the morning and make, basically make me go to the computer and write 1,000, 500 to 1,000 words each day. And I would literally put my hands on the keyboard and I have no recollection of actually writing this novel in the physical world. It simply came from my unconscious directly. And so at the end of it, I had this novel which contained dramatic erotica in it. And so I put it in my drawer. And in 2009, I, the Red Book was published and I realized, oh my God, Jung himself had an experience, a visioning experience like this. And, um, and so I, I just consumed that book. That book contains his visions and his experiences during his so-called Red Book period, but it was his midlife crisis period too. And I, I realized how profoundly the fact that his experience was analogous to my experience that I had said, wow, I really have to get into this work now. And I had already started reading the collected works directly, but then I started to study it very seriously. And so, especially in the last 10 years, I've been studying his work. But, um, you know, the Red Book... Do you think? Do you think getting the red book without the pictures would be uh, sufficient, or, or do you think the pictures are essential? Well, uh, I, the pictures are not essential for one reason, and that is that they're available online. So you can put, you can Google uh, Carl Jung red book photos uh, or images and all of them will come up online. Um, okay. And uh, all of the key ones, anyway. And so the interesting thing is, 
when Twitter was getting going, I heard of a woman that was tweeting out one tweet at a time verses of the Bible. And I said, wow, okay, so maybe I could tweet out the Red Book. And so the problem is that when you tweet something out, it ends up putting the first thing last. So as you're tweeting it out, it's fine. But if you, if you take a paragraph and say you're going to tweet five sentences, um, you have to start at the end and tweet the last sentence first and then the next sentence, then the next sentence, then the next sentence, then the next sentence. Then on your timeline, the five sentences will be in the correct order. They don't come out in the correct order, yeah. but, but once they're on your timeline, then they're in the correct order. So I was doing that. And what I discovered was that, first of all, they're full of wisdom, number one. And number two, uh, they make absolutely as much sense read backwards as forwards. So in other <laughs> words, you can, you can start at the, at the last sentence of the Red Book and read it from back to front, and it'll make as much sense as it did going forward. <laughs> So that was an interesting fact. That's a that's a yeah. psychological fact. Right, right. Uh, so, so what else? So you asked this question about what what had what book had affected me most of all, and that one certainly did in that way. Well, it, I would you said affected me the most, and it uh, took me back to an earlier statement I made where. I felt that God did care personally about us. Mm -hmm. and I don't know what your exact words were. I may have misunderstood you, but I thought you said God doesn't care a bit about us as individuals. And I just want to give you uh, an experience well, the, I had. That was, let me correct that, okay? Okay. The personal God does care about you, okay? In other words, your own, your own, own unconscious, the God that you have in your own psyche uh, does care about you, but the collective unconscious God um, doesn't. Okay, okay I, I got that. But I do want to tell you one experience okay. that was very meaningful to me. Uh, my daughter and I were visiting uh, France on a tour of prayer and art in mm -hmm. France. And one of the uh, churches we visited was Sacre Coeur. I don't pronounce French well. Mm -hmm. Sacred uh, Heart. Church of, Church of the Sacred Heart. Uh, when we were we were met at the door and told to be quiet and reverent, which was very different than Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a, a different atmosphere there. And as <clears throat> we walked around, I walked around a corner and saw a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I have a practice of gazing at images or gazing at religious art, and something will emerge in that gazing. And in that gazing, Jesus stepped out of the statue, and I knew that, the fu that his divinity was the fullness of his humanity. And um, I knew he had a tremendous love for me, and a tremendous love for all of humanity, and that he had, he, he was, uh, I don't know if the word is proud of us, or uh, he certainly had an empathy towards us as we suffer, and cared about that deeply. So with experiences like that, over there's, there's that ingrained um, sense of the love of God as the imp, as the energy towards individuation. Precisely, and that that's a vision that came from your unconscious. And what you what you are doing when you gaze at anything and and something some vision comes out of that that's an act of imagination 
according to Dr. Jung. I mean, that would be an act of imagination. And, you know, there's, there's truth in that. What it's saying to you is that what you understand as Jesus Christ does treat you in that way, precisely, okay? Um, and, uh, and you don't, I, I presume that you have no need to believe that. You simply know that. You know that that's true. That when yeah. you, when, when that, when you have that vision at Sacre Coeur, you, um, you, know that it happened and you know that it's true that's a religious experience and once you've had that experience then you don't need any creed then you know then you're with dr young and you know and so it's not belief anymore then it's n no <laughs> you know <laughs> okay and so that's what's in that first video that dr edinger gave about uh, encounters with the greater personality and and what he said at the beginning of that lecture is that the purpose of Jungian analysis now the purpose of Jungian analysis is to get the analysis to the point where uh, the analysis analysis has a religious experience like that the purpose of it is to have that numinous experience and once you have it then you know and you you don't need any other proof right and and so it sounds to me like you've had many of those experiences including your recent one and uh, you know and and you know what I what I would say is that you know, your spirit came from somewhere and it's going somewhere and that's happening whether or not you're physically here. Just as we're talking about Dr. Jung today and his spirit is definitely here between you and me on this conversation. And uh, just as much as the spirit of Jesus Christ is still here with us. and. And so, and once you know that, you know, and you don't, there's no doubts about fear, okay? There's no such thing as the need to fear death, uh, for example. I mean, Ernest Becker wrote a book called Denial of Death, and his, the premise of the book is that a lot of the things that we do uh, is driven by our our fear of death, uh, but you know um, the Buddhists say, uh, "Don't worry about death. Uh, I promise you, you'll succeed with that." <laughs> right? And and um, the uh, you know the point is you. Um, you know, once you're dead, you don't know you're dead, and it's only difficult for your family, so there's nothing to fear. The question is, how, how does your spirit live on? And, you know, it lives on in this video, um, and, and my spirit lives on in this video, and hopefully it'll be on YouTube for many years after both of us are long gone. But you know, even if it doesn't, you've conveyed something of your spirit to me, I've conveyed something of mine to you, and so that spirit, as you interact with your family and I interact with my family, has, has an immortality as well. My point, ultimately, about Jungian psychology is to say that every religious statement is true, and that's true of all religions and so what we need to do is reorient so instead of talking about the differences between religions we ought to f figure out uh, what's good about the other religions right. for example um, in Islam they pray f five times a day 
and uh, you know what could possibly be wrong with that that's a good right. thing and yeah. I've I've been in, in business meetings in in Saudi Arabia many times and you know everybody just when it's prayer time it's prayer time and they just stop and go and pray and you know prayer is a petition to your unconscious <laughs> okay believe it or not I mean Dr. Young explained it wait a minute here okay he explained it in this book and I read the 14 letters that are in this book. The book is The New God Image by Edward Edinger, but the most profound thing is uh, uh, in a letter that he wrote to the Reverend David Cox, and I've read all these letters into the YouTube channel, and so you can find them uh, and listen to my reading of them uh, there in a playlist called uh, Blunt Psychologists versus Theologians, okay, but let me just read, he was talking about God, and he says that that is the task left for man, and that is the reason why man is so important to God that he decided to become a man himself. I must apologize for the length of this exposition. Please do not think I am stating a truth I am merely trying to present a hypothesis which might explain the bewildering conclusions resulting from the clash of traditional symbols and psychological experiences. I thought it best to put my cards on the table so you'd get a clear picture of my ideas. Although this sounds as if it were a sort of theological speculation, it is in reality modern man's perplexity expressed in symbolic terms. It is the problem I so often had to deal with in treating neuroses of intelligent patients. It can be expressed in a more scientific, psychological language. For, instead, for instance, instead of using the, word, the term God, you say unconscious. Instead of Christ, self. Instead of incarnation, integration of the unconscious instead of salvation or redemption, individuation, instead of crucifixion or sacrifice on the cross, realization of the four functions, or of wholeness. I think it is no disadvantage to religious tradition if we can see how far it coincides with psychological experience. On the contrary, it seems to me a most welcome aid in understanding religious traditions. Okay, so. That's why. What is the name of that book? Uh, the name of the book is The New God Image by Edward Edinger, a study in Jung's key letters concerning the evolution of the Western God Image. And as I said, I've read all 14 of those letters, and what I was reading to you uh, was his letter to the Reverend David Cox and it was written on September 25th, 1957. So if you have Jung's letters, it might be in there. I'm not sure, because the Jungians hid a lot of this stuff. I mean, it was published, uh, but half of these 14 letters are in volume 18 of the collected works, so you have to get pretty deep into Jungian psychology before you can find them. Uh, but for, fortunately, Edward Edinger pulled them out for us. So uh, I want to thank you for your story about your father and suggesting to him he concentrate on what's happening now and what he wants to do until then. Mm -hmm. That was very special to me. Well, it's, it's a very important idea, I think. And, you know, as I said, when I said that to him, I mean, I, th I thought he was going to die within the next day or two. He was so weak, and he was totally emaciated. He was down to basically skeletal size and uh, down to 112 pounds from a man who had been in 170 or something like that. And, um, you know, when I said that to him, don't worry about that. We've got 100 billion people have tried it 
no complaints, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just just work on on what you're gonna do between now and then. And so yeah. I take that advice for myself as well. That I, you know, I in many ways I'm driven by what I'm doing uh, by myself. Okay, my my God image is is pushing me to do these interviews and to do this uh, website, this YouTube channel, um, exactly because, you know, the God image within me is directing me to do it. And, you know, I, I think if we look at Dr. Young's idea of synchronicity as it relates between you and me, the fact that you have found me and we're having this conversation and we may have many more is you know another example of of the hand of god um in exactly in this, i in the, i believe that in this world and so you know what i'm trying to do is build this bridge between the logos and the rational side and the and life literally life it's logos versus life uh, I, I've stopped referring to it as Logos versus Eros because Eros has this con uh, you know, this connotation of erotica, but but the fact is, nothing that you see in in this picture except me is alive. <laughs> okay, right. right. And so you know the Bible is is just a black doorstop unless you put life into it right otherwise it's nothing you know as is the case of all other physical things um, it's only when you put life into them that they have any meaning or use at all and, uh, and are you so familiar with the practice of lectio divina spiritual mm, practice no i'm not uh, this is where you come to, let's say, a, a story in the Bible or a portion of Scripture, and uh, you quiet yourself, you go into a quiet state, you read it, and then you bring yourself back to it again and see what emerges from what you've read, what is touching you. Mm -hmm. And then you read it two more times. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not to, not to study it. That would be the logos, I would think. Sure. Not to interpret it, not to rewrite it, but to feel it, to intuit it yes, for yeah. you on that day. And then to after you've got that, write why. Why is this meaningful to me today? And the Bible just explodes with life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I've been learning a lot of Bible lessons since I've been into this. And uh, I think I've given you access already to the, to the advanced reading group, did I? Yes. Okay, so in that Dropbox, you will find... Uh, the 32 seminar sessions we did on ION, um, which is uh, the book that I was reading from here, and also the first 13 seminar sessions we've done on Mysterium Conjunctionis. We, uh, it's a one-year project, so I, we still have a, more than two-thirds of the book to go, but, um, but ION is complete in the advanced reading group, so you can uh, read it if you want. This has been just a priceless gift, and uh, uh, I'll be going on to your contribution donation section and get a monthly subscription, and it's just priceless to me. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted it's helpful. I'm delighted that it's helpful, actually. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care now. Blessings bye -bye. on you and your girls and your wife. Thank you so much. Take care now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.